I'm here again today with Ruth Lindzinska, who you met a few weeks ago, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about stage fright. Now, you remember that she first began performing at the age of four and continues today. So, Ruth, I'm sure there was at least one time that you had stage fright. When was that? Well, that was when I first began to play, and I was taken to concerts, and at student concerts, sometimes the performer, whom I knew to be a very good one, could not perform up to par and would end up crying and being miserable about it. And so I thought, this is why, why does this happen? And I began to be a little bit nervous. So one time, I was practicing at home, and my father came in from the kitchen, and he threw a half tomato at me. It was all over my face. And my mother was horrified when she saw me like that. And what did you do that for? And she said, well, I told her that people come to concerts with bags of spoiled fruit. <laughs> Whenever you make a mistake, they're going to throw it at you. So <laughs> my mother said, well, you don't have to do it in the living room. <laughs> oh, no, poor girl. <laughs> so you thought if you made a mistake, you might have a tomato thrown at you. <laughs> so that was his way of dealing with stage. So that first time when you performed with an orchestra, I bet you were pretty nervous. How did you get ready for that performance? Well... When I was supposed to go for my rehearsal, I began to cry. I didn't want to go to that rehearsal. Why don't you want to go to that rehearsal? I said, because they're so good and I'm not. And so my father said to me, did you ever hear of Yehudi Menuhin? Well, of course, he's the person you always hold up to me. He's a violinist. And he said, well, you're a great big girl of seven. When he was five, he played a difficult concerto, a Brahms concerto, with orchestra. And here you're afraid to play an easy Mozart concerto, and you're all of seven years old. You should be ashamed of yourself. And so my father, of course this was not true, but my father talked me into it, and the rehearsal went all right. And so I wasn't afraid after that. Oh, wonderful. Tell us about that rehearsal. Well, we, they sort of laughed when they saw what they were going to play with, who was going to play their soloist. And that was me. And I was seven years old, and I was about to play the A major Mozart concerto. And so my teacher was conducting. This was at the rehearsal, and I went through a few scales in the concerto on the piano beforehand, and they heard me and saw me do that, but they still had a great many doubts, and then I saw my teacher talk to them, and he started to conduct at one point, and I didn't hear my entrance cue, which was supposed to be a flute. He had told the orchestra, don't play the flute. So I heard all the right music, but I didn't hear the flute. So I didn't play. Mr. Corto looked down at me. He said, why didn't you play? I said, the flute did not give me the right entrance cue. And the whole orchestra suddenly was quiet. They were attentive. And from there on, I never had any problems. So play, performing all those recitals, um, I'm sure you had at least one negative response in a, a review. How did that affect you? It affected me more because my father was upset with me than anything else. I could take anything except 
for his rages whenever I got a bad review. And I felt it wasn't my fault, and he thought it was my fault for not doing my best. And I said, I did do my best. He said, well, you didn't, according to this review. This is how it sounded to that person. Well, it was very upsetting, but it was upsetting for the wrong reason. It was upsetting because my father kept gnashing away at me. He thought it was my fault, and it wasn't my fault. I did exactly as I was taught to do, and, and apparently the critic in the audience saw that it was a learned performance, maybe too learned, and that's what the audience was witnessing, not a natural performance. And then now, through the... Anybody who expects an eight-year-old to give a natural performance is wrong because from where is the eight-year-old going to learn how to give a natural performance of a difficult concerto? It has to be a learned performance so that the critic who criticizes it for being a learned performance is a little bit stupid. And I didn't know that. <laughs> Oftentimes, when we have a negative review, we often then respond being more nervous the following time. Did you feel more nervous as these negative reviews came and your father showed his rage? Of course. I began to dislike walking on stage very much, and this was noticeable. I could not play as well. I knew I was going to be yelled at by the critics and by my father, and that just made matters worse. So I quit playing when I was a teenager altogether. And then what brought you back to music? I guess I love the sound of it. Oh, wonderful. And now that uh, you've been continuing to perform, uh, what are some of the ways that you have learned to uh, deal with stage fright? How do you prepare to avoid stage fright? Well, there are several things you can do. Number one, you can be so well prepared that stage fright hasn't an, no chance whatsoever. I work exceedingly slowly and I increase my speed by just one number, one metronome number at a time. An idiot could play anything that I do if they did the work. <laughs> well, it I takes doubt. many, many, many hours to do this. But when I walk on stage and play, it is as perfect as anyone could do it because I have put in those hours. I'm not at all afraid. I know I can do it. An idiot could do it. <laughs> oh, show us how slow slow is. You want to put the metronome on 40, 40. right? Yeah. Okay, we have it 40. After 40, I guess, would come about 60? No, 41. 41? Then 42. 42. I go from 40 to 50. So extremely silly. And, and then I would start the next day. If I didn't miss anything, I would start at 41 and go to 51. Then from 42 to 52. After that, from 43 to 53. And what so happens if you make a mistake when you're at 43 and then you make a mistake on 46? What do you do? I have to go over it and over it until there are no mistakes. So that I absolutely take a long, long time for the finger to learn how to do it. I cannot make a mistake. It's not possible. <laughs> so you feel very secure when you're yes. on stage. Uh -huh. 
uh, play a little bit of that uh, Bach one up the tempo now to see what that comes up as. some pieces that you learned as a child and you may not have played them for many years and yet you're pretty much able to play them for memory when you recall them and show examples so do you account that from that slow way of learning and it stays with you even memorization stays with you absolutely i practice very slowly and each hand alone so that i i absolutely know what i play I know you tell your students to play their pieces for friends and colleagues and in, in environments where they don't feel as threatened before the big performance. Do you do that as well? I certainly do. Every opportunity I get, I try out my new piece or part of a new piece or whatever, just on any piano, any place, any time, in front of anybody, in order to get the experience of playing, find out where the weak spots are. We're taking beta blockers. No, I have not, but I can tell you about one of my friends who did. And that was a very famous pianist. And he went to his doctor because he was afraid of walking out of stage and playing. His doctor said, yes, I can give you something. You take it a half hour before your performance and it will be as light as rain. And he did. Mm. This one it was fine. So he told himself, well, if one works so well, what will happen if I take two? So he took two. And that went really well. After a few more weeks, he took three. And that went well. Pretty soon he was taking six. Oh, my. And then he began to feel plenty. He be hands began to shake shoulders began to shake and he wasn't very sure of himself and he didn't like the way he felt then and he was afraid to walk on stage so he told his wife we've earned enough money let's go take a vacation in Italy wife had inherited a nice property and they thought well let's use it so they went and he didn't want to go back to the stage bought himself some nice Scarlatti Ricordi editions and he began to practice Scarlatti a little bit. He went through book after book of Scarlatti sonatas and he began to get offers from people. Come back to stage, we miss you. We want you back on stage, managers. We'll give you so much. No, he didn't. After 12 years, some manager had the idea, we'll start you off in Australia. All right, so he accepted that. But before he went to Australia, he wanted to see if he could play for his friends. Well, he went back to New York engaged Carnegie Hall in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. And he had the piano put on stage. He had about a dozen of his friends lined up to listen to him play the program he was going to play in Australia. It was not very easy the first time. He didn't want to even walk in front of us, much less play. It was very hard. He had to overcome that. And he had to overcome it without taking any kind of a pill. And he knew we all knew some music because we were all pianists. Finally, he 
made himself king and he succeeded and that broke the ice and Neron wasn't afraid anymore he could do it he knew he could do it succeeded wow wonderful story i also heard that when he gave his first uh, major comeback recital at uh uh, Carnegie mm -hmm. Hall that they actually the stage manager, the manager pushed him on stage and then he was fine. <laughs> well, he made one great big flop in his first piece and they left that in the recording so that everybody could hear it. That is possible. After that, he was fine. So we've been learning about meditation exercises in class. Um, did you ever do meditation before the performance? Well, I do what dancers do. And they do calisthenics backstage. Nobody can see us, of course. But here I am, orchestra is tuning up, and I'm backstage touching the floor so that the blood runs to the brain. I understand that that's very helpful. And I get myself sort of worked up uh, doing calisthenics backstage before I walk on stage nice little joke I can tell you about that is that Dimitri Metropolis, the great conductor of the New York Philharmonic, caught me doing calisthenics backstage. And he said to me, well, you know, nobody ever died from it. <laughs> We've also been learning about how sometimes you hear voices in your head when you perform, the critics, the doubters. What do you do to combat that? Well, I have always gone into a kind of imaginary world when I practice and when I perform so that I'm not even aware of the audience out there. I'm in my own world and things are happening in the, mu in the music and it's a, a wonderful feeling actually. And do you have imagery for the music, or do you have stories that you're thinking about? Well, I have. Sometimes it's a story. Sometimes it's just a place that I go to. And it is my place. When After I start to practice, within 10 or 15 minutes sometimes, I'm in that place, and I keep practicing. I have no idea... How much time has gone by, I have worked, I have accomplished what I needed to do, and I'm in that imaginary world. I can't explain it to you except that that's where I go, and very often when I walk on stage I go to that place. Well, I certainly know that place because often when you're practicing and I come in the room, I, I go like this on the side of the piano to bring you back from that place that you're at. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing with us about Stage Fright today. And it's wonderful to hear that it's possible to um, combat different voices and to go into imaginary worlds as well as to prepare. The way you prepare yes. helps you avoid those stage fright. If you are so well prepared, I don't think you worry about stage fright at all. It's just a word. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. You're welcome.